Thank you again. In the early 90s, uh, a buddy of mine that uh, lived in the Dallas area and uh, still resides in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex uh, invited us over to uh, their home. And he, uh, in, in the process of the evening, uh, in the course of the evening, he started sharing a story that had, uh, uh, had recently occurred in his life. He and another fellow, uh, who is actually a, an elder in Cagua, both of these uh, gentlemen will remain nameless unless I slip up and say one of the names uh, in the middle of the story because I don't have any notes written down about it. But anyway, uh, we're, we're in Hawaii and we're scuba diving. They really had looked, and I can't remember if it was uh, during the feast or, or just they were both over there uh, vacationing, but they wanted to go scuba diving, and, and both had had uh, pretty good experience uh, with scuba diving. So they went out uh, to scuba on a day when it was, it was pretty choppy and there were some, uh, some rough waters, but they still thought everything would, would be okay. And, and they went out about, uh, I, I think it was about a, quarter mile to a half mile out, uh, and, and then uh, began their dive to see some coral, and, and of course they got down un underneath uh, the water, and, and it all seemed pretty calm once they got down underwater and, and, and started seeing all the beautiful coral and such, but uh, the individual that told me the story said at one point he checked his oxygen tank and the oxygen uh, meter had just really dropped down. It was already down to about a quarter of a tank. And he thought, what in the world? I barely, I've barely been out here. Uh, and so he tried to signal the other fella and was, was telling him, you know, pointing to the, to the meter and saying, we got to go up. So, so they, they went up to the, to the surface, and, it, and by that time it had gotten choppier. Uh, and he started talking to him about the... Uh, the situations. I don't know. I don't know if I've got a leak in the tank. I don't know what the situation is, but it's not good. And uh, the then they so then they looked back to the shore and they realized we have no idea where we are. They didn't realize that in the course of, of doing their exploration down there and with the currents and such. And once they had come up, how strong the currents were, and, and it had brought them over to an area where it was a shoreline that they they didn't even recognize the shoreline and they, they realized later that they had been pulled maybe a half mile or a mile down the coast and and so then all of a sudden you know he's thinking well what what should we do here well I've, I still got a half tank I can you know we can I can stay up with with the tanks uh, like this I can stay up and and you know we can just stay on the top of the water but I would like to to go under is it, it's so choppy up here we'll go under and we'll try to get a little closer to shore so they, they tried that and then the tank was almost on empty and he, we, we've got a surface so he came up and then they started realizing with the choppiness of the water we we are in a fix here we got we've got to get in into shore but what was what what they saw in front of them in in the shoreline were, were rocky cliffs and, and uh, boulders and rocks, but everything was, was jagged and it kind of came straight up from, uh, from the water to where previously there had been a sandy beach. So they started trying to get in and, and, as, and, the, and of course that's where the waves were breaking and they would wait and wait and then let the wave take them and it, it, and it drove them into the rocks and then they grabbed on with all their might and then the water sucked them back out again. And then they, they, they worked up and then went in again. And it just con continually sucked them back out. They could not hold on. And you'd think, uh, well, and especially both these guys, these guys are, were, were brutes. I mean, they were, they were strong guys. But, but again, they're carrying all this gear. And when you get up, get up on, those, on those rocks like that and then have the water break on you and pull you back out, they just simply couldn't hold on. And uh, the fellow that told me the story said he looked over at uh, the other guy who was back and forth, and he was saying, and, and he was seeing it happening to him, and he, he realized, I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. Uh, I am running out of strength, and it is all I can do just to grab onto the rocks, let alone hold on. It's sucking me back out every time, and just totally drained. But then he looked as he as, as he was back out and getting ready to make a run one more time. He saw that the guy was able to hold on and he thought I've got to do this I've got maybe one or two left in me and then that next time it took him in and he grabbed with all his might and somehow he was able to hold on 
and then he was able to slowly, they were both able to slowly work themselves down along this rocky cliff to where they finally got to safety. And he talked to his buddies afterwards. He said, man, I, I, I didn't think I was going to make it. And uh, the other fellow said, I, I thought I was done. I was done. And I, I, I thought about that so story um, quite a bit uh, whenever, uh, and I've told some of you that story, uh, Anytime anybody ever says, uh, you know, scuba diving is great. Uh, well, you know, unfortunately, I've seen Jaws. That's, that's troubling. Uh, but then secondly, the James Bond movies. Anytime they're in the scubas, you've got the black scuba outfits and the red scuba outfits. And they've got those, those what are they called? Those guns, those spear guns. Spear guns, and they're shooting the spear guns. And you don't do well with the spear guns. And, and so I, all that, it just, it just scared me. But once I heard this story, I realized I'm never going scuba diving. Now, some of you really love scuba diving and, and, and uh, think it's the greatest. But uh, anyway, it's, uh, it, it was something that really, really impacted me when this individual said that. Uh, it impacted me, especially as I, uh, in recent years, have, have considered this passage that we've heard about uh, off and on and uh, have talked about. I want to talk about it again today because I, I think it is, is such a critical piece for God's people, and it's found in Hebrews 2. It's found in Hebrews 2, and we'll start in verse 1 today. Hebrews 2, verse 1. He says, therefore, we must give the more earnest heed. Now, why, you know, when he, when he makes this statement, whether this is Paul uh, or, or another author, uh, certain things point to uh, Hebrews being uh, authored or penned by Paul. But he, when he says, therefore, he's saying, because of the things that I've just said, you, said to you. And, and what, what goes on in, in Hebrews 1? What do we know is talked about in Hebrews 1? Hebrews 1 is the, the whole discussion of, of who Jesus Christ was, what Jesus Christ's role was as the Son of God. And, and as we, we look at, at him as the Son of God, he contrasts, them with the, contrasts the Son of God with the angels in terms of the inheritance that the Son of God receives uh, versus the angels. And, and the angels, what the angels do and what their service is and, and their role as, as spirit beings uh, and the, the power and might that they have and the relationship that they have with God, it's, it's an incredible thing. But... This situation with Jesus Christ is much different. It is inheritance related. It is salvation related. It is a co-inheritor of all things. And, and we see as, as he talks more in Hebrews 2, this is also is, is extended to mankind. That, that's very different from what is offered to angels. We're talking about salvation. We're talking about a, a physical human being that is now able to receive eternal life. Uh, speaking of, of you and me, what's in store for us. So uh, he says in verse 14 of chapter 1, you know, here, here's, here are the various roles of the, of the angels. Are they not all ministering spirits? They're serving spirits sent forth to serve for those who will inherit salvation. Uh, we, we are to inherit salvation. Again, as we, as we know in other passages, uh, inheritors, uh, co-inheritors with Christ. All things. So he says in verse, verse 1 of chapter 2 then, Therefore, because of that, we must give the more earnest heed. We must give all the more careful attention to. We, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. Lest we drift away. Uh, in, in terms of this, this concept of, of the, the drifting away, the Greek, uh, we've got the authorized king germ. germ. Authorized King James is, I think, the actual rendering, not the authorized King Germ. Uh, the authorized King James, therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let slip. We should let them slip, slip out of our hands. Uh, the, the Greek word here uh, for this, this uh, drift away or, or slip is parareo, uh, not to be confused with ta ra ra boom -a. for those of you that uh, remember that from childhood. pa ra ru ru -e uh, Anyway, so uh, just put that uh, there in your great 
lessons you've learned from Burnett here. But anyway, the, 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 he, the Greek here is that same thing of, of flowing by, lest it carelessly pass by us or flow by us or, or, to, or to let slip. It, it, we can let something slip. Now, now he con- contrasts the old covenant with the new. Uh, well, I want to read the ESV says, therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we've heard lest we drift away from it. Co- closer attention to what we've heard. So he says, for if, verse, verse 2, for if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, again, reflecting back to the old covenant, covenant uh, Deuteronomy 32 passages there, he says, in terms of us, this so great a salvation that we're, we're having here, how shall we escape from that? How shall we escape from the drifting away if we neglect if we neglect or ignore, as, as some uh, translations say this, so great a salvation. It's so great of a salvation, which it first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also bearing witnesses, bo- witness both w- with signs and wonders, various miracles and, and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. Let's ask ourselves today, uh, how can we, how is it possible for us to neglect or ignore so great a salvation? How, how can it be that we can do that? Is it possible for us to do that? He wouldn't write it there unless it is, unless, it's, unless it is possible for us. Well, how can we do that? How can it happen in our lives if, we, uh, are to, if, it, if it's listed there uh, as, as being possible? I submit uh, to you that for the called and chosen, now, again, uh, those of you that were here back in July uh, would have heard Mr. Horchak's sermon on, uh, in a message where he talked about the, the elements of, of what that sower and the seed was. Some seed falls here, some seed falls here, some seed falls here. Uh, I'm talking about the called and the chosen. I'm talking about the seed that falls on the good ground. It's good seed. It goes down in the ground and it comes up and bears fruit. Now, for those who are in that, that category, I submit to you that for this to be able to take place, for, for us to neglect or ignore so great a salvation, it usually occurs through a process. It usually occurs through a process, and I'm going to list three of these today that we're going to look at. Uh, We'll not spend a lot of time on each of them, but uh, they don't necessarily have to be this step followed by this step followed by this step. step. It can be any one of these three. Uh, It can be a combination of the three. It can be in any order. But it leads to a, a fourth process, uh, that, that a fourth step in the process that tends to take place. And I want us to, th- to think about these today and, and ask if any of these has the potential of, of taking root in our lives. Any of these sneaking up on us or, or have, have any of these grabbed a foothold in our spiritual lives, because these are ways that we can drift. These are ways that we can we can flow on by, and then all of a sudden be caught up to the surface and and realize I have no way, I have no idea where I am. And then all of a sudden I'm getting pounded to death on the cliffs, uh, on the rocky cliffs of life. Let's turn to Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes one today to begin. This one is, uh, this, this, first, this first area, it is, it is so incredibly basic, but it is so incredibly true on how we can ignore, how we can neglect, how we can drift from so great a salvation, so great an understanding. You know, here we are getting ready to, to keep the fall holy day season and all that that pictures in terms of the salvation for the 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 church at at Christ's return the the salvation for those who are alive at at Christ's return and and are then given the truth and begin to live the truth and birth more babies who grow up and birth more babies and more babies and more humans being born during the millennium 
and they're coming into the truth and understanding and, and, and recognizing the salvation process and committing to that. And then the, the great white throne judgment when all of mankind comes up and begins to have their judgment period as we've had our judgment period now and, and, and experience the, the, the understanding of what it is to, to be given or offered so great a salvation. How, how, can, we, how can we drift from that? The first one is very simple. How many of us here have, have witnessed that in our own lives? How many of, of us here have witnessed that in others' lives? It's simply disobedience. Disobedience, disobedience, the choice not to do what we are to do is, is a way that we will neglect so great a salvation. Disobedience not doing what we know to do, choosing to do what we shouldn't do, uh, causes us to drift. It happens with me. If I, if I get caught in doing things I shouldn't do and thinking things that I shouldn't do, I uh, think I drift. I drift. We, we all can drift from that. At some point, some form of disobedience begins to take root, and, and when it does, it uh, wreaks havoc on our ability to stay fixed on what is truly important. Is there any form of disobedience in your life now uh, to which you are allowing uh, or giving yourself over to? Uh, it, is, it is the way to neglect or ignore so great a salvation. I, one of the things that, that I've seen just in... in my years in the, the ministry, uh, not a lot, but a few, uh, one of the biggest, most common forms of disobedience in the church is, I'll say it again, one of the, the biggest, most common forms of disobedience in the church with God's people, ding, 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 is not listening. It's not listening. Just simply not listening. And how do we not listen? <laughs> we we don't listen when we don't listen to God, when we don't read God's word and, and we, we see what God is telling us to do. When we, when we aren't studying, we are, we are disobeying God. We are diso being disobedient to what he is instructing us and what he wants to give us as far as the direction of how not to drift off course. Uh, I, I can't tell you the, the number of times of talking with individuals and uh, when, they are, when they are turning back and, and getting back where they need to get, when God in his mercy has worked with them and helped them see that, one of the things they almost always say is, I had drifted away from staying connected with God. I just, I mean, I can't remember the last time I really, really studied. I can't remember the last time I, I was regular in prayer. It's... And that is a form of disobedience, is it not? I mean, that, that's a form of disobedience. Uh, we're going to read a little bit uh, from Scripture today, and it's not because I didn't prepare a lot. It's because it, it speaks to this, this point of, of, of listening as we, as we read God's Word and what we can learn from it. And, and it's here in Ecclesiastes. We're going to read a chunk of Scripture, and I, I want us to think about this whole concept of disobedience. Let's think about it in terms of, of the concept of Solomon's life. Now, those, uh, the, the teens of us who are here, who were at camp this year, you remember Mr. Sandlin's uh, Christian Living, right? Remember his, his, his Christian Living message? He talked about Solomon, who was in the situation where here he is, he's all of a sudden faced with being king. And, and God says, well, what, what, do you, what do you want? And, and we know the story. Solomon says, uh, I don't know how to you know, get up and get down, rise up and, and, and do this or that. Now I'm, I'm looking after the, the children of Israel. <laughs> Please give me wisdom. Please give me discernment. Please give me understanding to, to serve uh, so great a people. And a tremendous uh, thing to ask, a, 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 tr a, a tremendously humble thing to ask, and God granted him that. Now, think about that and, and keep that in context as we read Ecclesiastes 1 all the way through Ecclesiastes 2. Verse 12, chapter 1, Ecclesiastes. I, the preacher, was king over Israel and Jerusalem. 
And I set my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all that's done under heaven, this, this burdensome task God has given to the sons of men, by which they may be exercised or, or, or afflicted here. Uh, verse 14, I've seen all the works that are done under the sun, and indeed all is vanity. It's just all vanity and grasping for the wind. What's crooked can't be made straight. What's lacking cannot be numbered. I communed with my heart, saying, well, well look, I, I've attained greatness. I've gained more wisdom than all who were before me in Jerusalem. My heart has understood great wisdom and knowledge, and, and I set my heart to know wisdom and, and to know madness and folly. I, I set my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. That's interesting that, that he, he wanted to know that. I think it, it speaks to that a little bit more here a, a little bit later. I perceive that this is also uh, grasping for the wind. For in much wisdom is much grief, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. I said in my heart, come now, I'll test you with mirth. Therefore, enjoy pleasure, gladness, enjoy it full on. But also, uh, surely this was also vanity. I said of laughter, madness, and of mirth, what does it accomplish? I searched in my heart how to gratify my flesh with wine. That's interesting. I searched in my heart how to gratify my flesh with wine while guiding my heart with wisdom. Was he, was he really able to do that? He says, and, and how to lay hold on folly. How to, how to lay hold on folly? Here in his, this experience that he went through to try to understand the truly important ways uh, of life, of what is good and what is not, what is lasting and what is not, we see certain things that Solomon chose to do there. How, how to lay hold on folly? Uh, how to gratify my flesh with wine? And, you know, again, not, not that, you know, Scripture says wine cheers the heart of God and man. I mean, wine in its proper use is fine, but he's, he's looking to gratify his flesh with wine while guiding his heart with wisdom. Really, uh, how to lay hold on folly till I could figure out what was good for the sons of men to do under heaven all the days of their lives. I, I submit to you that something else is going on here. Yes, he learned from, from much of this, but, but compromises were made and there were certain, uh, there were certain rejections of, of the revelation of God. I mean, do you think Solomon had any idea that, uh, that it, it's not appropriate to, to gratify our flesh with wine, that it's, that it's not appropriate to lay hold on folly, but yet, yet he still did that so he could understand greater, and, and he reaped the consequences of that. Verse 4, he says, I made my works great. I built myself houses. I planted myself vineyards. I made myself gardens and orchards. I planted all kinds of fruit trees in them, and, and there is incredible beauty out there, and, and God expects us to tend and keep the garden. Uh, so nothing wrong with that, but he, he look at everything that he did. He said, I, I did all these things. Verse 7, I acquired male and female servants and servants born in my house. Yes, I had greater possessions of herds and flocks than all who were in Jerusalem before me. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the special treasures of kings and of other provinces. I had male and female singers, delights of the sons of men, musical instruments of all kinds. So I became great and excelled more than all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. Hmm. Uh, whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor. We know the story, uh, teens, as, as, as you're reflecting on this, and, and members, uh, those of us that have been in the church for any number of time, we know the shocking events of 1 Kings 11, of what, of what he did, uh, of, of marrying uh, all of these different wives from, from different, different countries and different kingdoms and getting caught up in uh, their worship, uh, even to the point of, of, building, uh, of building shrines and, and worship places and high places for every one of the gods that the different women worshipped. 
I mean, that, that was part of, of, his, of his experience here uh, of, of life, of doing this. I, I talked with a gentleman recently that uh, had spent some time and he, uh, in, in the East, in the, in the Far East, and a very insightful uh, statement that he made that I don't know why it, it never registered this way uh, to me before, but uh, he said, you know, you, you travel in the Far East and, and you go to some of these places and some of the most beautiful structures, some of the most beautifully designed buildings that blend in with the, uh, with the environment, with the, you know, whatever the, the, the trees and the landscape and this, are these shrines. And they're, they're pagan forms of worship. They're, they're uh, deities that they're worshiping or, or high places that they're putting that have nothing to do with God and God says he hates them. Uh, yet, yet they're there and people pay good money to go see them and, and to see these incredible uh, works of, of craftsmanship and, and, and skills. And then I think, okay, what about Solomon's kingdom? Uh, silver was nothing. It was nothing. It was nothing to them then because uh, uh, it, was, it was to be used in the streets or whatever for common things because he had so much wealth. What, what, do you think, what do you think in terms of effort and beauty and design and craftsmanship went into the building of these high places that, that Solomon got into? Uh, and and, and I, I'm sure he got into it with all his mights. He had the wealth of the nations to do that. And, and you see why, what, well, I guess what I'm getting to, is you see why down through the years, why some of those high places, you know, they say this king was a really good king, but he never really, he never really got these high places taken care of over here. And this one never, he never got those turned down. Uh, you know, so I, you know, I wonder how many of those things were actually constructed in great beauty and magnificence by Solomon himself. That, that didn't get torn down or got added to or, or this or that. Uh, and, and yet to hear him say that, that he did all of these things, yet his wisdom remained with him. Well, God did grant him wisdom, but again, laying hold on aspects of folly, laying hold on idolatry and these kinds of things, what, what did it do? How did it impact uh, Solomon. So anyway, he says, uh, whatever my eyes desire, verse 10, I didn't keep from them. I didn't withhold my heart from any pleasure, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this, and this was my reward from all my labor. I looked, I looked on all the works that my hands had done, all the labor in which I had toiled. Indeed, all was vanity. It was grasping for the wind. There was no profit under the sun. I turned, to myself, I turned myself to consider wisdom and madness and folly, again, both what he experienced, for what, what can the man do who succeeds the king? Only what he's done, already done. So then I did see, through, through this experience, he said, I did see that wisdom excels folly as light excels darkness. Okay, again, we have to ask ourselves, do, do, did he need to go through all that to get that? Do we need to go through all of that to get to that point? Versus what is the true revelation of God and, and a way to live. He says, I, so I saw that it, it does excel folly. Uh, verse 14, the wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. Yet I perceive that the same event happens to them all. So I said in my heart, as it happens to the fool, it happens to me. And, and why was I then more wise? I said in my heart, it's all vanity. It's all passing. It's all fleeting. It's all of no value, for there is no more remembrance of the wise than of the fool forever, since all that is now, uh, all that now is, will be forgotten in the days to come. And how does a man, how does a wise man die? He dies the same way as the fool. Verse seventeen, he says, "Therefore I hated life. I hated it because the work that was done under the sun was distressing to me. All is vanity and grasping for the wind. I hated all my labor in which I toiled under the sun, because I must leave it to the man who will come after me." Who knows whether he'll be wise or fool, yet he's going to rule over all my labor in which I toiled, in which I've shown myself wise under the sun. This is vanity. So I turned my heart and I despaired of everything that I'd done, all the labor in which I'd toiled under the sun. For there's a man whose labor is with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, yet he's got to leave his heritage to a man who hasn't labored for it. Verse 21, this is vanity. This is a great evil. 
Verse 22, for what has a man for all his labor and the striving of his heart with which he's toiled under the sun? For all his days are sorrowful, his work is burdensome, even in the night his heart takes no rest. This, this also is vanity. So then he comes to this statement in verse 24, one which we know. Nothing is better for a man than he should eat and drink, and that is his soul should enjoy good and in his labor. This also I saw from the hand of God. And I agree. I think that, that's a truism of God. God gives us that. Uh, for who can eat or who can have enjoyment, he says, more than I have. For God gives wisdom, he gives knowledge, he gives joy to a man who is good in his sight. But to the sinner, he gives the work of gathering and collecting that he may give to him who is good before God. This also is vanity and grasping of the wind or for the wind. I, I, I think about that. I think of uh, Solomon saying, I did this, I did that. Uh, and I laid hold on some of these things, and I, but I still, I still kept my wisdom. In, in a sense, I still kept my wits about me. And, and I, ask, I ask us to consider in, in the course of his life, because he's one of those individuals, as we've discussed before, who's a bit of an enigma. We don't know what happened to him at the end of his life. We don't know if he truly turned, uh, if, if, uh, if he came to these conclusions while not fully coming to that uh, in his own life. Uh, I would like to hope that he did. Uh, I don't know. God knows. I put that in, in God's, God's hands. But, but to, to think that he really kept his wits about him, I, I've often thought about this, uh, given all that the scripture says, and, and wondered uh, at this man of wisdom, uh, if, if that really was, was what was truly going on. What, what degree of wisdom did, did he keep? Look at, uh, look at Ecclesiastes 7, and I speak to that uh, especially because of the statement that he, says, that he says here. Reflect I reflect on this with uh, so many families in the church. Uh, all that Solomon had, all the, the wisdom that he was given, all the, the blessings that he had, and what did he really have in the end? And, and what do we have? What do we have in the church? What do we have in the truth of God? Verse 23, he says, All this I've proved by wisdom. I said I'll be wise, but it was far from me. As for that which is far off and exceedingly deep, who can find it out? I, verse 25, I applied my heart to know, to search out and to seek out wisdom and, and the reason of things, to know the wickedness of folly, even the foolishness and mad, even of foolishness and madness. And I find more bitter than death the woman whose heart is snares and nets, whose hands are, are fetters. He who pleases God shall escape from her, but the sinner shall be trapped by her. <laughs> so, you know, obviously Solomon had 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 all kinds of issues uh, with women, as as First Corinthians, First uh, Kings eleven says, he he loved women and and gathered all these women as as wives and concubines, and it didn't go so well for him because here here's the statement that he makes, uh, verse verse twenty seven. Here's what I found, says the preacher, adding one thing to the other to find out the reason which my soul see, still seeks and I still cannot find. One man among a thousand I've found. You know, out of a thousand men, he said, I, I, I come across one who's a solid, solid person that I can count on and, and all the things of, of a person of integrity and, and that. But what's he say about women? But a woman among all these, not, not one among a thousand, but of all, he's never found a woman, never found a woman that has anything of value, of integrity. That's just tragic. It's tragic, but, but again, I, I, I would submit that, uh, that, that that is in part because of the decisions that he made in terms of the way that he was seeking to find out wisdom and understanding. God sets up a, a different plan for us, and, and, I, and I, I recognize, brethren, I recognize that there are individuals uh, here and, and around the church who have had very troubled and problematic marriages. Uh, and and I, I recognize as well that there are many here that have, that have had tremendously blessed marriages. Uh, God does give the, the, 
that's the, the beauty of God's way of life is that we have the ability to choose. God doesn't make any of us do anything. And, uh, and, and, and we see that evidenced in, in, in the choices that people make, the choices that we make in our own lives, uh, the, the problems that we see in, in marriages, and the incredible joys and blessings that we see in marriages when, when both are walking in harmony with God's way. But I know I've found a woman among a thousand. I, I, I found a good one. <laughs> and I know uh, many, many of us here have been, have been blessed with that. And, and that in itself is, speaks to the, the degree to which God's way is a, a beautiful way. It, it's a way that, that, has, that has meaning and purpose. And even, even marriage in this life, though, we recognize is temporary. It's temporary because it points to something greater, a, a greater marriage that, that encompasses this inheritance of salvation. But it's all meant to, to help us see the greater picture. Uh, so, again, th does anybody here possess more wisdom than Solomon? Uh, that, that he possessed in any one time in his life. Can you and I dabble in the fire of disobedience in some way and dabble into folly and dabble into this and dabble into that and not be burned? Can you and I drift from the way and not lose sight, not go off course completely? Yes, Solomon says, I, my wisdom remained with me, but... but did his, did his character remain with him? Did he, did he continue to walk in God's ways? I, I submit to you, and I submit to you adamantly, uh, he drifted way off course. It, it, it's slightly drifting off course when you're building idols uh, and, and worshiping those. And, uh, you know, the, the situation of Moloch, you know, where you cast your children to the fire. I mean, it, it's, it's unbelievable the, the degree to which he, he shifted and... and and uh, slipped from what he knew to be right. I, again, I think that's what Paul is, is telling us here with the area of disobedience. But let's go to this epistle in Titus 2. Uh, Titus 2, Paul is, is talking to Titus about, about what he needs to do uh, in, as he works with, with God's people. And I, I, I look at this passage, I was thinking about that, this passage this week in terms of this area of, of disobedience versus obedience. And I, I don't think uh, this was only uh, the situation that was dealing, uh, was occurring at the time. I see elements of this uh, in, our, in our own lives now. But I, I just find it interesting how Paul says, hey, here are the things that I want you to really work with, Titus, as you're dealing with the, the, the people of God here uh, in the areas which, where, where you uh, oversee. Verse 1 of chapter 2, but as for you, Titus, he's saying here, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, sound teaching. So those of us here that consider ourselves as older men, I, am, I definitely am not older yet. I'm in the young, like I've told you many times, younger, middle-aged, uh, slightly, um, yeah, slightly younger, middle, older kind of. That, that the old, but, but those of us who are in this category, uh, again, older men, I'm probably this, that the older men, we are to be sober. We're to be sober-minded, uh, sober. Sober. Uh, what's the opposite of, of sober? Uh, you know, filled with revelries, filled with things that are that are uh, are not staying focused. We're to be reverent. You know, as we get a little older, we can kind of become irreverent uh, and and not uh, recognize authority and not recognize uh, how we are to uh, be reverent before God. We can start to get lax on these kinds of things. But but to be reverent, to be temperate. To be sound in the faith, sound and, and, and rock solid in the faith, rock solid in love, rock solid in patience in dealing with others. What about the older women here in our congregation? Are you reverent in behavior? Are you obedient in that regard? Are, uh, do you tend to slander? Do you tend to be given over to much wine? We sometimes abuse uh, alcohol older ladies. Uh, 
teachers of good things? Or what, what comes out of our mouths? Do we see ourselves in a role as, as teachers by the, by the way that we act and by the way that we, we uh, and what we say, what comes out of our mouths as, as we work with those younger uh, than we ladies? That they admonish the young women. Now, now look at verses 4 and 5. How, how many of the marriages today when we, we watch, uh, what is it? H, no, HGG, HGTV doesn't have this. It's the other one. What is it? Uh, I'm forgetting. Uh, say yes to the dress. Or uh, what's the other one? Uh, all the different weddings that, you know, and everything that's going on with the big wedding planning and who's going to win because they have the best, best wedding. You know, how, mu- how often do we hear these kinds of things really, really emphasized in, in marriages that are, that are getting ready to occur? Uh, as and again, we've got Chase and, and Olivia uh, tomorrow here, for 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 the ladies here that they're to teach the young women to love their husbands, to be to love their children, to be discreet, to be discreet. What is it to be discreet uh, in in our behavior? Nothing that can be condemned by being indiscreet. To be chaste, to be homemakers. How how much is that uh, put forth? out there in today's society, to be uh, homemakers, good, to be obedient to their husbands. I heard something this week about uh, some, someone was putting forth the, the concept of heterosexuality is, is, is detrimental to the, the strength of society because it perpetuates women being uh, abused by men, so women should be lesbians. I mean, it's just it's crazy stuff, but but it's it's that kind of thing that it just uh, when 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 God is out of the picture, it just goes down this course that's just uh, unbelievably stupid. But 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 that that women are to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Notice what he says about young men. So young men here today, are you sober-minded? Uh, are you sober-minded? Or is it, it's time to party? You know, let's party. You know, are, are, are you sober-minded? In, uh, and so he says to Titus, in all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works. Uh, those of us uh, here in the congregation, do we show ourselves to be a pattern of good works? As people look at us, do they say, there's a pattern of good works. This individual walks in God's ways in everything he or she does. In doctrine, that individual shows integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed having nothing evil to say of you. And he goes on to talk about how this works as a result of our being redeemed by the sacrifice of Christ. So, so how, how are we doing in these areas? Uh, it is such a basic concept, a basic construct, but it is crucial to not <laughs> drifting. Okay, all right, I'm going to put uh, the second and third ones, kind of blend them together, uh, but uh, in, in terms of, of how we can drift or how we can neglect so great a salvation is simply not tending to it. If we don't tend to, uh, like, like you tend to a garden, if we don't tend to this incredible salvation that, that's been offered to us and, and we've received the down payment through the receiving of the Holy Spirit, if we don't tend to it, we will drift. Are you tending to this great salvation? Or uh, this falls in the same, same pattern. Uh, and let's, uh, let's turn over to the book of Hosea. This third area is putting our mind on other things that replace that, that replace that understanding, that replace that, that fixation on the, the critical piece of salvation. Again, I'm putting these two together. They're two and three, but they, it's disobedience and then these two. And, and all of these can fit in. But we're going to read... Uh, something here in, in Hosea here in just a sec. I'll go ahead and turn there. You know, it's, it's so easy to get bogged down, even in our prayers, on good things. You know, Lisa and I were talking about this this week as, as we were reflecting upon uh, the various uh, health situations. And I, I just realized now I forgot to read some of the health updates. Uh, we've got, uh, you know, of course, Ashley Peoples going through what she experienced uh, 
uh, here this past, uh, this past week and, and ultimately leading to the surgery and, and she's doing well, she's back home uh, recovering and, uh, and everything is going well there. Uh, and I was talking with Greg last night about that and just about how the last several weeks have just been really, really, really tough on the whole family. And, and then in the course of that, you know, of course we're talking about Megan and what Megan is dealing with, uh, that she's been dealing with this for years and she needs to get into uh, uh, some type of treatment in, in New York to see if they can better diagnose the situation. But, you know, Greg was talking about just what that was like on the family to deal with that with, with Ashley in that period of time. And, and then to, to, to realize what's that got to be like for the Rosses to deal with that for a, for a long period of time. And then let's just start plugging in names, brethren. Let, let's plug in names. Let, let's talk about anybody else that, that we have here. Some of you are dealing with incredibly challenging family situations that are, are gut-wrenching, uh, areas of sin, areas of, of just conflict that have continued. Some of you are, are dealing with other kinds of health uh, situations that have been going on and on or, or just the, the thing of, of not knowing, you know, what's, what's the next step. You know, we've got the Lusks. Uh, Gloria uh, wanted to let everybody know to uh, the, thank you for your prayers for her. They're, they're getting the results of, of the scans uh, coming up here next week. But, you know, what's, what's that like? To, and many of you have been through that, to, to think about okay, I, I don't know what, what's going to happen. I don't know if I'm going to be cancer-free. I don't know if I'm going to have uh, cancer and what we're going to do about it and the stress on that. Uh, what I'm saying is, is what Lisa and I were, were talking about this week is God wants us to pray for these situations. And, and when we see the, the trials and, and the sufferings of humanity, the shootings that we had you know, in, in El Paso and, and also uh, Dayton, Ohio, and, and, and the sufferings that go on there, the sufferings that are going on in different places around the world, the, 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 the problems and conflicts that we see in our own country, uh, as we see in is, Israel, the uh, physical is, Israel, and, and all of this. And, and Scripture says, sigh and cry for these things, and, 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 and you pray for God's kingdom to come. And it says in Scripture that when, when, one, of us is, when one of us is experiencing great uh, success and happiness, we're, we, joy, we joy with them. We, we're joyous with them. And when, when one suffers, we all suffer. Uh, we're, we're to offer supplications to God, to intervene for these people. But when we get into those situations, and you make out your prayer lists, and, and you go through these names, and it takes a while to go through them, and you start thinking about some of these situations where you know individuals, and you know the, the deep inside, behind-the-scenes things and, uh, of certain individuals and what they're going through that maybe others don't know, and you pray about that and, and ask for God's intervention and, and empathize with them as they're going through that. And what's it do? It wears you down. I mean, there are, and, and here we are, uh, a church that we're 10,000 or some in, in this organization, and we get, we get uh, prayer requests from all over the world, like we talked that situation last week of the, of the family that had the, uh, they were about to get married, and here the, the, the girl uh, gets, gets ill and dies, and she's got her, uh, her husband-to-be that uh, now is, is without his wife to be and the impact on the family. I mean, this kind of stuff, it is, it is, is tragic and it's very sad. And, and as, we even, as we even put our minds on the things of the sufferings that God's people are going through and the people that we know and people that we're all going through, it, that even weighs us down. It, it, it can take us down. And we're, we're not to neglect that praying, but... We've got to keep the focus where it needs to be. And even in the putting mind on the other things, replacing it, we can even get off a little bit just on seeing all the sufferings that we're all going through. We've got to do that while continuing to stay fixed on this plan of salvation, on this incredible thing that God is, is offering to us and that is offering uh, all mankind through his plan that is so great a salvation that anchors us. Because otherwise, even when we're doing the right things to, to pray for, for individuals, it, it, can, it can get us off kilter. You know what I'm saying? 
I don't know if you've experienced that. We, we've experienced that. And it's, it's, uh, it's, it's something that if we don't talk about, if we don't keep that focus where it, it needs to be, we can even drift in that regard. Uh, you, think about, uh, you think about Hosea. You know, here he's told, let, let's look at Hosea 1. So Ho Hosea 1, verse 2, when the Lord began to sp speak by Hosea, prophet of God, you know, as it says in, in Peter, Peter's writings, these, these prophets had the spirit of Christ in them. They understood uh, the, the, the plan of God in terms of, of the restoration of Israel. They understood the Messiah coming. And, and, and here is an individual who had God's spirit. The Lord said to Hosea, Go take yourself a wife of harlotry for, and children of harlotry, for the land has committed great harlotry by departing from the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblium, and she conceived and bore him a son. And then he goes through and starts talking about these different uh, children that she, uh, that, uh, she births and, and then tying all this in to the, 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 the future of Israel because they're turning from God and, and, and how God is going to cast them aside because of this. And I, and I read all that and, and I think of that and look at verse, uh, verse 1 of chapter 3. Then the Lord said to me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by a lover and is committing adultery. Most probably, uh, we, we've thought that this indicates taking Gomer back again after she's all caught up in uh, adultery. It, it could have been a, another person that he married as a result of her committing adultery, but most will, will tend to think that it is taking Gomer back again uh, and is committing adultery, just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel who look to other gods and love the race and cakes of the pagans. Uh, so he said, I bought her for myself, 15 shekels of silver and, and one, one and a half homers of barley. And I said to her, stay with me many days. Don't play the harlot. Don't have a man, so too I will be toward you. And I, you, know, you think about that and you think, okay, uh, here he is, he's, he's, he's uttering the words of God in this prophecy, yet he's living this. He's living this in his life. He's a physical human being that is, is, is carrying on a, an existence. He's married to an individual who is not faithful, and, and he's seeing that being played out in Israel, uh, and, and yet... Here is a prophet who is faithful to God, and I, I can't help but think as he utters uh, the words of God that he's also thinking about this in his own life uh, and keeping that perspective of what is truly important as he just is going through an awful experience in his life. Look at uh, Hosea 14. Hosea 14, verse 1. He says, O oh, Israel, return to the Lord your God. Return to the eternal your God, uh, Yahweh your God. For you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take words with you and, and return to the Lord. Say to him, take away all iniquity. Receive us graciously, for we will offer the sacrifices of our lips. Assyria is not going to save us. And it's still fascinating for me to watch all the different things that we see going on with the countries and the way that they're connected and 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 trying to work out these these different alliances that shift constantly and and yet as god said it then it's it's that way now assyria is not going to save us we'll, we'll not ride on horses nor we'll say any more to the work of our hands you are our gods for in you meaning to god the fatherless finds mercy god says i'm going to heal their backsliding I'll love them freely, for my anger is turned away from him. I'll be like the dew to Israel. He shall grow like the lily and lengthen his roots like Lebanon. His branches shall spread, his beauty shall be like an olive tree, and his fragrance like Lebanon. Those who dwell under his shadow shall return. They'll be revived like grain and grow like a vine. Their scent shall be like the wine of Lebanon. Ephraim shall say, what have I to do with idols anymore? I'm done with that. I have heard and observed him. I am like a... Green cypress tree, your fruit is found in me. Who is wise? Let him understand these things. Who is prudent? Let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right. The righteous walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. I think of Hosea living that, and, and even though he's uttering the very words of God, he's keeping that perspective in his own life of, of tending to the concept of the salvation that awaits him. When we think of Christ's ministry, you think, think of Christ's ministry, 
in what he did and what Christ was to experience. Uh, we, we see a statement in Luke, a few final passages here. Uh, Luke, Luke 7. You know, anytime I read Christ's words, I always try to, I try to think, well, what, what is his situation here? What's he, what's he going through? And who is this, this being that is saying this? And, and in this frame of mind, as he's working with these individuals, with his background of all things. And, you know, I think, okay, here is this being that existed for eternity. And now here he is uh, in flesh and blood. With, with all of the, the temptations that come at him, uh, yet totally focused, totally never drifting. And we see this statement here of, of John asking the question of his disciples to, to ask to Jesus, ask Jesus and his disciples, uh, this, this individual, Jesus Christ, who came preaching the, the gospel, the good news, the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. Luke 7, verse 19, John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent, to Jesus, sent them to Jesus, saying, are, are you the coming one? Are you really that individual? Uh, you know, here he was, he preached that, he taught that, and he says, or do we look for another? When the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, to Jesus. Here he's saying, saying are you Jesus? Are you really the coming one? Do we look, or do we look for another? In that very hour, what did Jesus Christ do? He cured many of infirmities. Think about that with respect to spiritually for us, taking away our spiritual infirmities. He cured, for many, cured many of infirmities, afflictions, evil spirits, and to many blind he gave sight. Spiritually, we've been given sight. Verse 22, Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things you've seen and heard, that the blind see, God has helped us see. The lame walk, we were all damaged, and God strengthened us so that we can walk forward towards the promised land. The lepers are cleansed. We've been cleansed of our sins. The deaf hear. Our ears were closed, and now we hear and we understand God's way of life. The dead are raised. Through baptism, we are raised a new creation, uh, completely committed to God as God's children. The poor have the gospel. They have the good news, the, the glad tidings preached to them. This, this is what Christ was, was saying. This is what I am doing. Tell John that. And John will keep that focus of, of what was on Christ's mind. This is Jesus Christ, that, that same being who, who knew as he began preaching the gospel, as he began teaching uh, the glad tidings of, of, of what was to come, he knew he was going to be dying, he knew he was going to suffer, he knew at one point he was going to have the sins of all of mankind on him, placed on him as he died, Christ, as he was saying this, and as he started his ministry, in, in, uh, let's look at that in Luke 4, 17, as Christ started his ministry, he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's, he's quoting Isaiah here, uh, verse 18. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recover a sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. For sake of time, we won't read Isaiah 61 and, and Isaiah 62, but read that. Read, read the glad tidings that, that Christ is referring to here as, uh, as I, Isaiah prophesied that of Jesus Christ. And then think of Christ as this individual that is coming forward to say this. He's coming forward to say this. This is what is on my mind. This is what I'm focused on as I'm going forward. It, but as I'm focused on it, do you think Christ did not know every single sin that's happened by every single individual down through time? Do you think Christ did not have in his mind the ability to recognize all of the evil and atrocities that have ever occurred, to, to, to witness and experience the death, the, the gruesome death that, that many have experienced, the suffering, the abuse that others down through, uh, down through time have experienced, all of that is in his mind. All of that, he sees all of that. He sees every aspect of, of every element that Satan the devil has purveyed upon mankind. He's seen it all. 
And yet Christ still, as he starts his ministry, knowing what he's going to have to suffer and experience, he focuses on his life and focuses his mission on the glad tidings of the coming kingdom of God. That, that's how we tend to it. He tended to it so he did not veer, so he did not drift, so he did not flow right by and, and seeking God's righteousness in everything that he did. Two final passages. Let's go to Hebrews 6. Because the fourth, the fourth element of, of what can happen uh, in terms of neglecting so great a salvation or ignoring so great a salvation is simply not even grasping what it is. Not even grasping what it is that we're ignoring or neglecting. Like Mr. Uh, like Mr. Horchak mentioned in his message, uh, you know, there, there all kinds of different people come to services. Uh, we have folks that uh, have no real interest in, in that, but they come, it's a good place to be. Uh, pretty pretty friendly for the most part, the people? Uh, you know, no, I'm kidding. We're, we're, we're friendly. We're friendly. We're friendly and welcoming. Good place to be. Good, good social experience. Good for the kids. Uh, there are that, uh, and, and, and yet uh, not really getting what it's all about. Uh, there are uh, those that uh, are here for a while and get pulled by this or pulled by that. And, and then again, you know, you come to the parable of the sower and the seeds. That, that's, what, that's what Christ said is the nature of it. But there are also those that can drift away and not even grasp what salvation is because they've moved into a state of ignorance where they're coming up out of the water from scuba diving and have no idea where they are, how did I get here, and all of a sudden they're being thrashed and pounded and driven into the rocks and sucked out by the current of the sea and dragged back in and banged up and unable to hold on to anything and get anchored. Hebrews 6, Hebrews 6, verse 9. Hebrews 6, verse 9. I think Mr. Averett quoted this in his uh, message a while back about the fixing on the point uh, when we're out in, in, the, in the water and knowing where we are. Uh, all of that, the historical drift message that Mr. Register gave years ago about how we can drift uh, over time and not stay focused on what's, what's true and right. Verse 9, But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, <laughs> though we speak in this manner. For God's not unjust. He's not unjust to forget your work and your labor of love, which you've shown toward his name, in that you have ministered and that you, and to the saints and do minister. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of the hope until the end. Don't become sluggish. Imitate instead those uh, who, through faith and patience, inherit the promises. For God made a promise to Abraham. He could swear by no one greater, so he swore by himself, saying, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to multiply, I'm going to multiply you, Abraham. And so after he had patiently endured, as, as Abraham did, he obtained the promise. For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of the promise, the ones who are, are going to inherit the salvation and, and the co-inheritors with Christ of all things, the immutabil immutability of his counsel confirmed by an oath that by two immutable things it is impossible for God to lie, and through that we have strong comfort we fled for refuge to lay hold on the hope that's set before us. This hope, this hope of salvation, this hope that, that we are never to become ignorant of, that this hope that we are to grab on to is an anchor of the soul. And it is sure and steadfast, and through that it enters into the presence behind the veil, the direct relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ where the forerunner is entered for us, as we mentioned, even Jesus having become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. You know, Christ said, who do you say I am? And Peter said, you're the son of God. That, that's who you are. And Christ, what's Christ say? Flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, did it? 
This is spiritual, what we've been given. This, this salvation is, is incredibly meaningful. It, it is our purpose for existence. It is our purpose for, for serving God as being instruments as he leads others to salvation. Obedience, tending to it, not replacing it with other things, and in the end, we lay hold on it. Let's turn finally to 1 Timothy 6. Mr. Mr. Jones read verses 9 and 10. We'll pick up just after that. 1 Timothy 6, verse 9 and 10. Do we recognize the drift that can take place, the, the, the drifting along? Those of us that have had the seed put on good ground, uh, are we anchoring it? Anyway, uh, verse, verse 11. But you, O man of God, flee these things. 1 Timothy 6, verse 11. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight a good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Grab onto the rock. Grab onto it and hold on tight. You know, don't lose your way to which you also were called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Uh, verse 14, that you keep his commandments without spot, without, you know, and do it blamelessly until our Lord Jesus Christ appearing. Look finally at verse 18. Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share. Brethren, Hopefully all of us are in this situation, that we're storing up for ourselves a good foundation for the time to come, that we may lay hold, <laughs> lay hold on eternal life.